Hey guys, welcome back to Fix It Friday. So today we're gonna to be talking about the NES Top Loader console. So this was a second model of the original Nintendo Entertainment System that was released around 1994. And it has a number of unique advantages over the original design. The biggest thing that everyone knows about is the fact that it's a top loader, so you can put your games in like this, and so it means that you don't have all the annoying connection problems that come with the original console, the toaster, where you'd have to put it in and then press down, and eventually the 72-pin connector on that system wears out. So no issues there. Uh, another thing that's really cool about this system is that it's region-free, um, so you can play other other games from different regions without any issues. So it's really nice for those reasons. Um, however, it does have uh, some drawbacks, one of which is this back port over here, which only outputs RF video and audio. So that means that the video quality tends to be pretty poor, especially on a monitor display. And you also can get jail bars on the screen, which also look pretty crappy. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna fix all of that by installing Tim Worthington's NES RGB mod. So I have done plenty of videos about this modification in the past, but there are some unique things to consider when installing it in a top loader. So we're gonna go over that today and I'll show you the things that I do to um, optimize this installation. Okay, well, let's get to it. But first, let me take a couple of seconds for a word from the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. PCBWay is my favorite manufacturer of prototype PCBs. They offer very high quality prototype PCBs and they also do larger scale projects. They offer excellent service and they have fast delivery times. They also have a shared projects section where you can browse through lots of really cool DIY projects that you can make for yourself, including this power cleaner modification for the Game Boy Advance. So I highly recommend that you check out the link in the video description and give PCBWay a try. Okay, so back to this week's project. Okay, so taking apart a top loader Nintendo is pretty easy. So you've got four game bit screws on the bottom that you need to remove. And once those are off, you just have a bunch of Phillips screws on the top here. I think it's about four in total. And there's two longer ones here that hold the cartridge slot down. So all you really need is a screwdriver and a game bit screwdriver. So once that's all set, we're gonna go ahead and remove the console. And we're also gonna be removing a couple of other things as well. Specifically, we're gonna get this heat shield off and um, we're gonna remove this screw that attaches the 7805 voltage regulator to it. Um, and so it's all these screws here on the bottom and then this one up top here. The reason why is because we're gonna do this modification in a way that prevents, it doesn't require any cutting of the shell. So we're gonna take this plastic piece off and we're gonna replace it with this 3D printed SNES multi-out. And so this allows us to get composite video, RGB and S video all from one connector. And we do so in a way that doesn't require any kind of uh, permanent damage or to the shell or to the console. Okay, so we've got the motherboard out here, and the first thing we've got to do, like we do with every other NES RGB, is we've got to remove the graphics chip, otherwise known as the PPU. So to do this, I usually use a three-step approach. The first step is to flip this thing over and to add fresh solder to all of the, the pins, all right here. The second step is then to take my Hakko desoldering gun and use that to clear these all out as much as possible. And then finally, I'll use a heat gun and I'll just warm up this region with about 300 degrees Celsius of hot air. And that helps to soften up the last little pieces of solder that might be sticking to the few pins that are left. And then I can very carefully remove this. It's really important, and I can't stress this enough, that you should not use any kind of force in taking this out. If you do, the chances of damaging the, ripping up some traces or damaging the chip are very high. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and then we'll follow up with some other components that we're gonna remove to complete this mod.
All right, so everything is all finished, and so you can see that the PPU looks perfectly fine. Looks like it was almost never put into a Nintendo in the first place. The pins are super clean. And then here's the PPU um, vias, and you can see that they all look great. There's no problems with any of them on that side and on this side as well. Um, what's also nice too is I didn't even need to use Flux. I mean, sometimes I will, but in this particular case, it came out very smoothly and I didn't need that. So I definitely recommend that three-step approach if you're ever planning on doing this yourself. It's a lot harder if you um, only try one of those methods. And honestly, if you're using any kind of force at all, then you're doing it really dangerously and you can do some damage here. All right, so that's all set. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna remove this RF modulator and we're gonna also remove this original power bracket. So that requires some desoldering as well. We've gotta remove these three points here and then these ground anchors for the RF modulator. And then over here, this is the built-in power jack um, that's part of this plastic enclosure. So we have to desolder these points as well. So let's go ahead and get that started. All right, so we've removed the RF modulator and I just wanted to kind of show you what I did here. So you'll notice that I needed a lot more heat to do this. Um, and so I was using the desoldering gun as a source for heat instead of my iron. The reason being that like this ground plane right here is pretty thick, so it absorbs heat very rapidly. And so you need a lot of heat to, to just loosen up these points and get everything fully desoldered. Um, you also notice that the steps I did this, so you actually want to remove the power jack and that plastic piece first and then tackle the RF modulator because this stuff just gets in the way. Um, and it's really important to keep heat on here because if you're not careful, it's really easy to pull vias on, on the power jack and you need to make sure that these RF modulator points are clear too, um, just so that you don't accidentally pull any vias there. But that was not an issue here. Everything went pretty smoothly. And so now we're ready to go ahead and get started with the installation of the NES RGB. Okay, so one thing I forgot to mention here is how you add audio to the NES RGB. <clears throat> so with the top loader in particular, you definitely want to add audio to go through the NES RGB instead of tapping it at the output. The reason why is that there isn't as much audio amplification on the top loader. So if you just output from where it came from over here, where the RF connector was, you'll get sound, but it'll be super quiet. So you have to like blast your speakers to the maximum in order to get anything. So the best way to get audio is to tap from pins one and two of the CPU. And you can see I've already tinned those, those areas right there. And then you're going to connect them to two wires. I'm sorry, to two pads rather on, on the NES RGB. So pin one is going to go to pad A and then pin two is going to go to pad B. So let's go ahead and just do that now.
All right, so we're getting to the end, and now what I need to do is I need to basically make the Super Nintendo style multi out. And to do that, I have this PCB that I had printed by um, by PCB Way, who's the sponsor of this video. These are really nice. Um, and they're very compact, and so they, they work with a lot of the 3D printed designs that are available, including the one that I'm using today, which was made by LaserBear. Um, it's an open source um, design for the PCB. It's also an open source design for the 3D print, and I'll have files linked um, for you guys to use yourself. So um, basically all we've got to do is just follow the standard Super Nintendo style multi-out. I will also include a link for that in the description as well, but I'm also going to color code it to try to make things easy. So I'm going to use R, G, and B, red, green, and blue for those colors. I'm going to use this orange for sync. Um, this is going to be, I think, ground and so on and so forth. And so anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and start, start wiring this up. But again, if you, you're following along, consult the, the, the documents that I have linked and you can figure out how to wire this up. All right, so we've got this uh, new 3D printed connector attached, and it was a little bit difficult at first, but that's just because these holes were a little bit smaller from the 3D print, and I just had to use a larger screwdriver to get everything secured, but it's nice and secure now. So um, I've actually bolted the board down into its original position, because now what we're going to do is we're going to route all of these wires to their respective locations on the NES RGB board. Um, what I try to do here is be, you know, careful with the wiring. You don't want it going anywhere near over here because the, the plastic lid kind of comes down over here. So either you route it around these posts like so, or you can potentially snake them underneath. There's like a little post, but you definitely want to have it, you know, screwed into place when you're doing this step because it's kind of difficult um, and you can make a mistake if you don't. All right. So let's, uh, let's make these final connections and uh, go from there. All right, so the final thing that we need to do is add a power jack because without this, of course, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> I also added a zip tie over here just to kind of manage the cables and keep them all under control and in the same place. Okay guys, so we're back and I'm here with the NES RGB all installed and finished and you can see it right over there. And, you know, the picture on this thing looks absolutely fantastic. And so right now I have an example. This is Vice Project Doom, which is one of my favorite games on the NES. Uh, I had it as I was a kid, and people don't really know about it, but it's a lot of fun. It has a kind of Ninja Gaiden sort of feel to it. Um, and, yeah, it looks absolutely stunning with this modification. So I really like this mod because it keeps the stock look of the top loader. It doesn't involve cutting the shell, and you still get all the functionality and features of the NES RGB. 
Okay guys, so that's basically it for this video. Um, if you like this kind of content, then subs consider subscribing to the channel. I have videos like this out every Friday, and then some of my friends in the Long Island Retro Gaming Expo also have some new series coming up as well, so keep an eye out for that. All right, well, thanks again for watching, guys. I will see you next time.